we want to welcome our wonderful sister, Melissa. And I just want to thank you for taking the time and to prepare this and, and to uh, you know, share with us whatever the Lord has put in your heart. If you all want to welcome Melissa. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy and an honor to always um, be able to come before you and share the message. Um, we want to welcome all of those that are watching and will be watching in the future. Um, we're located at 5879 SBID at the Hampton Inn Hotel. Uh, at the meeting room. We meet here on Sundays at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we're here for Bible study on Tuesday nights at 7. We also have uh, every third Friday of the month, Women 31, and that's at 7 o'clock. We have uh, different speakers that come and share their lives, their testimonies, and just their journey and walk with the Lord. So those that would like to come and be a part of that, Come and bless us with your presence and fellowship with us. Uh, we also have uh, at the the fourth Thursday of every month we have the full gospel business men's women's meeting here as well, and that's at seven o'clock. And so those that are business owners um, that would like to come or have previously owned a business or any type of business that you have put your hand to to uh, create or to help um, get started come and join us and share with us your knowledge your wisdom and how God has led you into that business so the message that I bring um, it's kind of hard to deliver it but I pray that everybody's hearts are opened and um, receptive to receive. So just let us pray right now. Father, we just thank you for this day and we thank you and know that it's the day that you have made. You do so many wonderful and beautiful things each and every day for us, Lord. And we take note of that and we thank you. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your leadership. We thank you that you order our steps. When we surrender ourselves to you, Lord, you're the one that orders our steps. And so nothing happens by just happenstance or coincidence because if we surrender ourselves to you, Holy Spirit, you're the one that leads us and guides us to all things. And so thank you for all that you're doing, all you have done, and all that you're continuing to do. And I pray, Lord, that you just anoint my lips for this message to deliver it. And if at any time, Lord, you want to interrupt and you want to speak something different, so be it, Lord. Have your way. Have your way, Lord. We thank you, Father. We surrender ourselves and we open our hearts to receive from you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. 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 So how many of us like pain? Nobody, right? Physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, right? We don't like pain. Is pain necessary? Yep. Sometimes. Yeah. I'll go through the school of hard knocks and different yeah. phases and chapters of life. Yeah. So pain is necessary to get our attention. It is used as a warning and for our protection. When we experience pain, we stop what we are doing and start the process of trying to figure out what caused it. God designed our bodies to have pain receptors. These receptors send a message to our brain and cause us to react to the severity of the pain we just experienced. Have you ever stubbed your toe? That hurts, huh? Amen. That kind of pain will definitely get your attention. It doesn't last for a long time, but it will certainly cause you to slow down and pay closer attention to where you are walking and what you are doing. Yeah. Our brain takes note of it and commits it to memory. 
Chronic pain or persistent pain is more of a long-term and high-intensity pain that requires treatment or therapy to manage it. Nobody wants to experience chronic or persistent pain. It can be really intense. The nervous system's function <clears throat> is altered and becomes more sensitive to pain. Sometimes it becomes so sensitive that a gentle touch is recognized as pain. <clears throat> Excuse me. We would all prefer to go through life without experiencing pain, but that is just not going to happen, and believe it or not, it's a good thing. We need to experience a healthy amount of pain in order to grow physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. The title of this message is Pain Has Purpose. John 16, 21. A woman, when she is in labor, has pain because her time to give birth has come. But when she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of her joy that a child has come into the world. Amen. <clears throat> when we're about to give birth, nothing else matters at that point. The only thing we want is to bring our precious baby into this world. Depending on the complications we experience during labor, we might have to trade our life for theirs. When we get to see and hold our baby for the first time, we know that all the pain we went through for the whole nine months up until that moment was well worth it. Through this experience, we learn that pain has purpose. When we exercise, jog, run, or lift weights, we have to learn how to endure sore muscles and pain. If we stop as soon as we feel a little discomfort, we will never see any results. We have to learn how to persevere if we want to reach our goals. In order to achieve the greater reward, pain is necessary. James 1, 2 through 4. My brothers and sisters, fellow believers, when you have many kinds of troubles, trials, testing, you should be full of joy. Consider it all pure joy. Because you know that these troubles test your faith. And this will give you patience, perseverance, endurance. And let your patience, perseverance, endurance show itself perfectly in what you do. Have its full effect. Finish its work. Then you will be perfect and complete mature and whole or completely mature and will have everything you need lacking nothing. Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only this, but we also have joy, rejoice, boast with our troubles through suffering, trials, persecution, because we know that these troubles, suffering, trials, persecution, produce patience, or endurance. And patience, endurance, produces tested and proven character. And tested and proven character produces hope. And this hope will never disappoint us, let us down, or put us to shame, dishonor us. Honor and shame were among the most important values in first century culture. Because God has poured out his love to fill our hearts or flooded our hearts with his love. He gave us his love through the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us. Let's look at some biblical examples where pain has purpose. You will see how their faith, patience, perseverance, endurance, maturity level, character, and hope are tested. The first one that we're going to look at is Hosea which was a prophet of God. He was told to marry a woman by the name of Gomer and to have children with her. She was a prostitute. Hosea was obedient and did as God instructed, even though he knew that Gomer was going to be unfaithful to him. The reason that God asked Hosea to do this was because he was going to use his marriage as an example to show the people how they were being unfaithful to him. <clears throat> Hosea 
Hosea 1, 1 through 11. This is God's message to Hosea, son of Biri. It came to him during the royal reigns of Judah's kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. This was also the time that Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king over Israel. Now what I'm going to say here, it's in the Bible. So I'm not saying anything, but I can't cushion it. I've tried and the Lord won't let me cushion it. So I'm reading directly from the Bible. It says, this whole country has become a whorehouse. The first time God spoke to Hosea, he said, find a whore and marry her. Make this whore the mother of your children. And here's why. This whole country has become a whorehouse, unfaithful to me, God. Hosea did it. He picked Gomer, daughter of Diblaim. She got pregnant and gave him a son. Then God told him, name him Jezreel, which means God scatters. It won't be long now before I'll make the people of Israel pay for the massacre at Jezreel. I'm calling it quits on the kingdom of Israel. Payday is coming. I'm going to chop Israel's bows and arrows into kindling in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer got pregnant again. The time, this time she had a daughter. God told Hosea, name this one Lo Rumaha, no mercy. I'm fed up with Israel. I have run out of mercy. There's no more forgiveness. Judah's another story. I'll continue having mercy on them. I'll save them. It will be their God who saves them, not their armaments and armies, not their horsepower and manpower. After Gomer had weaned no mercy, she got pregnant yet again and had a son. God said, name him Lo Ami, meaning nobody. You've become nobodies to me, and I, God, am a nobody to you. But down the road, the population of Israel is going to explode, past counting like sand on the ocean beaches. In the very place where they were once named nobody, they will be named God's somebody. Everybody in Judah and everybody in Israel will be assembled as one people. They'll choose a single leader. There'll be no stopping them. A great day in Jezreel. In time, they'll come back. Hosea 3, 1 through 5. Then God ordered me, start all over. Love your wife again. Your wife who's in bed with your latest boyfriend, I'm sorry, with her latest boyfriend, your cheating wife. Love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people. Even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. I did it. I paid good money to get her back. It cost me the price of a slave. Then I told her, from now on, you're living with me. No more whoring, no more sleeping around. You're living with me and I'm living with you. The people of Israel are going to live a long time stripped of security and protection, without religion and comfort, <laughs> godless and prayerless. But in time, they'll come back, these Israelites, come back looking for their God and their David King. They'll come back chastened to reverence before God and his good gifts, ready for the end of the story of his love. Hosea lived a life of suffering and embarrassment, but remained obedient to God because he knew there was purpose in the pain. How many of us would have been faithful and did what Hosea did? When we experience a little bit of pain, a lot of people run to the doctor instead of running to God, instead of trusting him. I have nothing against doctors, but doctors are supposed to be secondary, not first. God is the one that heals us. God is the one that takes care of us. God is the one that provides everything for us. 
But as soon as we have, oh, something's wrong with my stomach. Oh, I have this persistent headache. Oh, I have, have we gone to God first? Hosea in that time was a prophet. A prophet in that time had so much more value because he was the man of God. And in that time, things were so much more severe than what they are today. So I say that because it truly was embarrassing for him. He had to defile himself to marry a prostitute. Thinking of it in those times, right? But he was obedient. And God's plans and purposes were carried forth through him. What is God trying to carry through us? What is God trying to carry through you? Each and every one of us, we gather here, and it's not just for the fellowship. That's wonderful. That's part of it. But there's a greater purpose. We come here to get fueled. We come here to get on fire. We come here to have a fresh word from the Lord. Not just from the person that's speaking it, but the Lord is speaking through different things that are spoken. Amen. And that's what we should be listening for every single time. It's not, oh, so-and-so speaking, I got to be there. No, it's God through the person. Amen. And then it's not just sitting and listening and taking notes, which is wonderful. But what do you do with the notes when they're done? What do you do? Right? We take notes and we have journal upon journal and we don't want to throw them away. Do we revisit them? When we start going through something the next day, that week, the week after, do we look back and say, Lord, <coughs> what, and revisit it? We've got it so easy today. We have messages that are recorded. We have YouTube channels. We can go back. <coughs> We don't even have to take notes. We can sit in full attention and listen, right? But by writing, it's scientific. When you, when you write, it commits it to memory. There's something about the writing it down, and it commits it more to your memory. But even the world has tried to take that away, and let's just watch it. Let's do audio books instead, because we're way too busy, right? Next, we're going to look at Job 1, 1 through 12. Job's character and wealth. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God with reverence and abstained from and turned away from evil because he honored God. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. He also possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke pairs of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very great number of servants, so that this man was the greatest and wealthiest and most respected of all the men of the East, Northern Arabia. His sons used to go in turn and feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send word and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of their feasting were over, Job would send for them <clears throat> and consecrate them, rising early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Job did, all, did this at all such times. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, adversary, accuser, also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Then Satan answered the Lord, from roaming around on the earth and from walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, 
Have you considered and reflected on my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God with reverence and abstains from and turns away from evil because he honors God. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge of protection around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and conferred prosperity and happiness upon him. And his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch, destroy all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that Job has is in your power. Only do not put your hand on the man himself. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Job 1, 13 through 22. Satan allowed to test Job. Now there was a day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabians attacked and swooped down on them and took away the animals. They also killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger also came and said, the fire of God, lightning has fallen from the heavens and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels, and have taken them away, and have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, <clears throat> another messenger also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly, a great wind came from across the desert and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died and I alone have escaped to tell you. How would you respond? Everything gone in an instant. How would we respond? Shocking. Devastated, right? We would be devastated. How did Job respond? Verse 20. Then Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head in mourning for the children, and he fell to the ground and worshiped God. What? Okay, I'm on board. Tore his robe, shaved his head, he's mourning. It says morning. Can you imagine screaming, yelling, travailing? Right? Why? Why did this happen? How? But he didn't stay in that. Instead, he fell to the ground and he worshiped God. It was the most devastated time in his life. He just lost his whole world. He was the most respected, the wealthiest. Now, what does he have? From the natural, it looks like nothing. Just God. But even saying, just God. No, he has everything by having God. Right? Yes. But would we react like that? There's a lot to learn from that story. Amen. And if it says it, we believe that it's true. We test it. Okay, I know that I just got in this type of accident. I know I was just diagnosed with this type of news. But you know what? I'm going to fall to my knees and I'm going to worship you. I'm going to worship you. I'm putting it into practice, what Job did. Many times I've done that. Okay, you say, marching around, that the walls of Jericho are going to come down. That sounds silly to me, but okay, I'm going to act this out. 
in faith, I'm going to step out and do it. And then I see it happen right before my eyes. So the next time that something happens, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Speak it out. Come on. Fall to your knees and worship the Lord. Right? We got to activate it. We can't just, and we're not a quiet church here. All of us stay afterwards in fellowship. We're not quiet. <laughs> Moving on. Verse 21. He said, Naked without possessions, I came into this world from my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the, the name, name of the, the Lord. Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. He didn't blame him. How many of us would? How many of us would? Right? You might ask why. <laughs> and that's fine to ask why. But not, not to stay there and not to become bitter not to um, be so caught up in the, in the why of it, but instead just trust him. You know, there's, a, there's something that I've learned to say throughout the years is, okay, this don't catch you by surprise. So what's the plan? What are we doing? You get a flat tire. Okay, great. What are we doing? Automatically, I shift it to him instead of just focusing on what it is. And as we do that, we see him move. We see him move. We don't, there is no getting it right all the time. We live in fallen world, it's very corrupt. We live in flesh. We live in flesh, and we always have to crucify the flesh. Right? But we've become so accustomed to, I just don't want any pain whatsoever. Headache. Grab the bottle of whatever it is. Advil, Tylenol, whatever your preference is. Instead, okay, turning to you. I can't work with this. I can't concentrate with this. I can't continue to go with this. Right? And also take an authority over it. Amen. In my head, the way I see this, if I go for that bottle, I'm giving the authority to that bottle. I'm taking the authority away from him, and I'm putting it in that bottle. I'm putting my trust and my faith in that. Right? Here are the results that came from Job's pain. Job 42, 10 through 13. God restores Job's fortunes. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice as much. Then all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before came to him and they ate bread with him in his house and they consoled him and comforted him over all the distressing adversities that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of money and each a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had seven sons and three daughters. We like the ending. We like the blessing. We like hearing that it's twice as much was restored. But are we willing to go through the process to receive the bounty at the end 
For those that play games, Xbox, whatever your platform may be, when we play a game, we have to go through a checklist of things in order to finish the level. We can't skip through that checklist. Right? Yeah. And we know that the enemy distracts us many times with so many different things, games included, but he still puts the play in there. We got to go through all these checklists and get all these things, collecting items, collecting weapons, collecting finance, whatever it may be. That's the way life is. But we want to skip the process and just go straight to the end. It doesn't work that way, right? And we got to enjoy the journey as we're going through it. We got to change our perspective. When we just stay with one perspective and looking at the situation just head on, we don't see the full picture. But when we rise, he says we're seated in heavenly places with him. How many of us actually rise to the heavenly seat with him and see the full picture? Yeah. Like when you're up in an airplane and you look down on everything. It's a different perspective than when you're on the ground and just looking at it head on. Right? So many times when people come to me for ministry, I start out by saying, I'm the wrong person to talk to about that. Because I'm not going to tell you things that others have. The perspective I have might be different. I'm going to back it up with scripture. And so I say that, so that way that lets you know, hey, I may not get what I want from this one. If you're looking for a pity party, it's not going to happen. But I've already said that in a polite and loving way. Um, it might help you see it from a different perspective. Maybe you don't want to see it from that perspective. You want someone to join you instead from the way you see it. But what good would I do you if I did that? I'm to speak life into you. I'm to sharpen you. Sometimes when I need to knock the rough edges off of you. <laughs> right? That's what we do. Yes. That's what we're here for. Iron sharpens iron. It does. But if you take iron, I wish I had something metal. Can I use this? Do you like that sound? Yeah. No. <laughs> That's the same thing that we do. Thank you. I didn't mean to mess up your thing if I did. <laughs> it's fine. Iron sharpens iron. And we can say, amen, hallelujah, yeah, preach it. <laughs> but then when we actually start talking with each other and ministering to each other, and you ask, what do you think about this? and iron starts to sharpen and you hear that rubbing sound. And all of a sudden it don't feel good. Well, I don't like what you're saying, sister. I, I don't agree with you. I, oh, mm, that, that don't, mm. I'm sharpening you. What, you, you say amen, hallelujah, amen, all this stuff, but now it's happening and, and then they want to write you off. <laughs> right? Yes, iron sharpens iron, but learn what that true meaning means. So the results from Job's pain are fantastic. The results from our pain are fantastic as well. We have testimonies that get built from that. Whatever process we go through, we walk it through, and we come out sharpened by the Lord. We come out with more clarity. We come out with wisdom. We come out with understanding. And now we're able to bless others. We're able to help them and in the midst of their trials and tribulations and say, I went through that. And this is what happened. This is the process that I went through. Some people like to drown you out in that, though. Yeah, but what happened at the end? <laughs> Or, uh, that's too difficult. Pray for me. Just, just pray for me. 
right? James 5, 11. Take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit. All the time honoring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power, and you know how God brought it all together for him at the end. That's because God cares, cares right down to the last detail. The last one we're going to look at is Paul, who used to be Saul. So 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 28. Five times I have received 39 lashes from the Jewish leaders. Three times I experienced being beaten with rods. Once they stoned me. Three times I have been shipwrecked. For an entire night and a day I was adrift in the open sea. In my difficult travels, I have faced many dangerous situations, perilous rivers, robbers, foreigners, and even my own people. I have survived deadly peril in the city, in the wilderness, with storms at sea, and with spies posing as believers. I have toiled to the point of exhaustion and gone through many sleepless nights. I have frequently been deprived of food and water, left hungry and shivering out in the cold, lacking proper clothing. And besides these painful circumstances, I have the daily pressure of my responsibility for all the churches, with a deep concern weighing heavily on my heart for their welfare. How many want to go travel with Paul? <laughs> Yeah, let's go for a cruise with him, right? Yeah. yeah. No, right? Stay away from that guy. Yeah. Right? Was he one? Iron sharpens iron? Mm -hmm. How many missed out on his ministry? How much pain did Paul go through? A lot. Did he give up? He persevered, right? Yes, he did. Persevered, changed his character, right? When it talks about prophets, it's not just the word <coughs> prophet. Prophet, especially nowadays, is someone that hears and speaks what the Lord says. There's office of prophet and there's just prophet. But multiple times, God uses each of us as his mouthpiece to speak to each other. It doesn't have to come from someone that wears a special hat, a special robe, garment, particular colors, whatever it may be. We have to know who we are in Christ. We have to know who Christ is in us. We have to trust God. We have to surrender ourselves to him. We have to go through the process and we have to learn to recognize him when others speak to us. It's important because when you have so many people speaking into you and everyone thinks they're right, what they're saying, you have to be wise enough to know and hear God's voice through that person. Close off the other voices. No matter what relation they are to you, that's the hard part, and that's what the enemy uses and takes joy in using. Because sometimes it's the closest ones to us, but if they're not lined up and they don't have the fruit of the Spirit evident in their life, you can't listen to what they say. We have to be careful, right? 
So in conclusion, I ask you to carefully think about how you would answer these questions. Are you going to back down and compromise with the devil to avoid pain? Are you going to turn aside from your mission with God and make peace with Satan? Right now, we are being tested and sifted by our enemy. Our faith, patience, perseverance, endurance, level of maturity, character, and hope are all being tested. In order to achieve the greater reward, pain is necessary. Our greater reward is Jesus. His pain had purpose, and so does ours. He gave us everything he had, including his life. We need to do the same for him. Whatever it is that we go through, we have to remember when we mess up and we made a wrong choice, surrender yourself to the Lord, humble yourself to the Lord. He knows the intention of the heart. We can't lie to him. He'll course correct us immediately. Of course, correct us. God is all wise at all times. He always provides people for us. He gives us a place. Don't judge the package that the help comes in. Don't judge the voice. But listen to what the Lord has to say. So I would just like to pray real quick. Father, we ask you to forgive us for backing down and compromising with the devil to avoid pain. Each of us know what we're responsible for. Each of us know our own selves and things you've called us to do that we have not stepped into. And we ask you right now, we humble ourselves and we lay it before you and we ask you to forgive us, Lord. We're sorry for that. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for turning aside from your mission and making peace with others. We ask you to forgive us for times that we've been tested and sifted and we caved in. Lord, we need for you to build our faith, our patience, our perseverance, our endurance, our level of maturity, our character and fill us with your hope, Lord. So we welcome you every day to do what you want to do and to have your way, Lord. We trust you. Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much. You gave everything. You gave your life for us. And we know we're expected to give our life to you. Because when we surrender our life to you, completely surrender it, Lord, we have everything. Just as you restored Job, we thank you for the restoration that will take place here, Lord, here and now. We thank you that you return to us things that the enemy has stolen. Bring to our remembrance right now things that we have allowed the enemy to steal. And as we, those things come to memory, we'll ask you for forgiveness on them and we'll ask for your instruction of how you want us to proceed. Thank you for the fruit that is here in this room. Thank you for the transformations. Thank you for the fruit and the transformations that are gonna take place from all those that are gonna watch this, Lord. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your compassion that always covers us. And thank you for the course correction that has taken place. You say to believe with confident trust the things we have prayed for, as long as it lines up with your will, we will have it. So thank you, Father, for lining us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Great message. Hallelujah. Uh, we're going to close the, the service. After service, if you need prayer, <coughs> come, <coughs> come and see us, any, any, any one of us. We're going to take our offering. It, it's a very good message, uh, and, and I need you to, you know, if you have not taken note, then go back to, uh, to Facebook or YouTube and take a look at it. <coughs> Pain is part of, of, of God's process. I mean, you wish it was not there. You know, you, I, I walk in a, in, in a job and, and then walk on a nail. <laughs> it's painful. Why, why is it painful? So that we can stop, take our shoes, and look at the damage and say, okay, what is going on? I need to do something uh, about it. And, <clears throat> and if you're going through some kind of a painful situation with money, with friend, uh, it is God telling you, okay, you need to sit down and say, okay, what is going on? Take some time and, and, and then, then, then talk to God and see. See what 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 God you know wants wants from us, you know. Um, good, yeah. I'm gonna listen to it more because it's uh, it was very very uh, interesting. Hallelujah. <clears throat>